personally, I first discovered uh, Father Ron back in 1990 when he was our keynote speaker at the Canadian Catholic Students Conference at the University of Calgary that year. And I've been following him ever since, reading his, his uh, columns and his books, and whenever I can get to a conference with him um, in Anaheim and other places over the years. Um, to many people I said, along the way as I promoted and as we were getting him, I said, if we get any Catholic speaker in the world, it would be Pope Francis. <laughs> but if Pope Francis is too busy, we'd get Ron Rollins. He would be the guy I want. Um, and we got him, um, which is awesome. I didn't know that we'd ever be able to get him because um, he's a huge speaker. We're pretty small, but we did get him. And uh, I'm so happy. Um, so, um, yeah, I wanted to get him for every conference I've been part of with Remick, and with my seventh conference here, we finally were able to put it together. So, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Father Ron Rolazzo. Thank you. First question, how's the sound? Everybody can hear? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Dan for staying on my case for a number of years. And... Um, it's good to be here because uh, I grew up on the Alberta border. I have dual citizenship, Saskatchewan. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, when, when Dan first invited me here, they, apparently this thing was supposed to happen in Banff. And so I sent them an email. I said, can't you find a decent venue someplace in Saskatchewan to have this thing? <laughs> so he checked out Provost on the border, but we're here today. Okay. Um, first met Dan, we met 29 years ago. He was a young university student. That was a young priest. It's <laughs> what 30 years will do to you. Okay. When I get to the, um, rather than PowerPoint, I just brought you some handouts so you have the notes in front of you and so on to follow. Um, our theme is a spirituality of education. Um, kind of our vocation as educators, but I want you to know this isn't just about teachers in classrooms, a spirituality of education, but you know, you educate. What you do in the classroom is only a small part of your life, those of you are in classrooms. But we're educating all the time. Many of you are parents, your kids. That's your primary teaching. Uh, but we, your, your uncles and aunts and your uh, friends and your having coffee circles, we're always educating and being educated. So that the spirituality of education is not so much about classrooms. So this isn't going to be a class in in, in the education department at the University of Alberta. Okay. So I want to do three things with you. There's three talks. Tonight I want to talk about spirituality and then education. And tomorrow morning I want to talk about um, just the context. Because we don't educate in a vacuum. You know, what, what's our context today, particularly for religious education? And in the afternoon I want to send you home with what I call Ten Commandments for the Long Haul. So let's start tonight with the word, I want to talk, the spirituality of education. So I want to just work on two words, spirituality, education. Okay. What is a spirituality? Okay. Well, let's start with something more, it's actually accurate, but it's, uh, it's a Charlie Brown cartoon. But I remember one of my all-time favorite Charlie Brown cartoons, those of you who think you're all old enough to know what Charlie Brown is. Okay. <laughs> And he's playing baseball, and he's standing in right field, which you know in Little League, that's where they put the poorest player, you know, goes to play right field. But he's standing in grass, and the grass is taller than his head, you know. So he says, I don't mind if they put me into right field where they put the poorest player. Okay. Second thing, he said, I don't mind if my parents came to see me, watch to play the game, now they won't see me in the grass. Third frame, he said, I don't even mind that they may never hit a ball out here, and if they hit one out, I wouldn't be able to see it to catch it. The fourth frame, he said, but I really do mind, I don't even know if I'm standing in the right direction. <laughs> spirituality is a lot about being turned in the right direction. Because spirituality isn't a program, it's, it's, it's the way we walk in life. And we're always walking, and it's very important we have the right direction. Because every step we take then gets us closer. If we're turned in the wrong direction, every step takes us away. Um, that's just a little 
trite thing to start with, but like I said, that's, that's basically, essentially. Those of you who read the book, The Holy Longing, and if you haven't read it, you don't have to, and so on. <laughs> yeah. But I start the first three chapters by defining spirituality, which I'm going to do with you very quickly here tonight. You know, what is a spirituality? We you know, um, just a little footnote. First of all, in English, that's a new word. You know, the French always have the word spirituality, but if you go to a library, you look at books, you won't see that in English books before the 70s. You'll see it in French, but in, in English, that's a word of our own generation. You know, and today it's a university discipline. We have a PhD program at our school, the entire doctoral program in spirituality. There's institutes of spirituality. That, that's a, a relatively new word in the English language. But today, it's, there's every kind of book being written in spirituality. So what is it? Well, I want to begin by saying it's not something that you have an option of doing or not. It's not so much, you know, like, I think sometimes we think Mother Teresa had a spirituality or, you know, people who go to church and make retreats and have a spirituality. No, everybody has a spirituality, you, you know, because spirituality is the first time. It's what you do with your eros. What we do with our, with our erotic energies, and erotic energies, you can see, it's, it's much, much wider than sexual energy, you know. Uh, what we do with our, with our energy is our spirituality. Let me try to tease that out. You know, we're born, and we come to consciousness, and at the very center of our consciousness, I want to say after it's not at the periphery, at the very center of our consciousness, there is always a fundamental dis-ease, not disease, but dis-ease. There's, you know, there's many words you can use. There's, there's a loneliness, there's a restlessness, there's a disquiet, there's some kind of tension, there's some type of aching. And that's not at the edges of our experience, at the center of our experience. You know, as Henry Nouwen used to say, you know, you're not a person who lives in kind of an habitual intimacy, and sometimes you get lonely. You're not a person who lives in, you know, quietude and solitude, and sometimes you get restless. You're a person who's restless who sometimes finds peace. You're a person who's lonely who sometimes finds intimacy, you know. We're a person who are frustrated and sometimes we find satisfa satisfaction. Notice where the default is. Now, I want to give you just expressions of that. Um, the first book I ever wrote, which was the takeoff of my master's thesis, was on this, you know. And I was still a young student and I researched a lot, you know, philosophy, writers, poets, artists. I'll just give you some expressions of just the many different expressions of this. So, for instance, one of the most famous poet, I mean, quoted lines from one of the most famous books in history, St. Augustine's book, The Confessions of St. Augustine. It's one of the all-time classic books that's been written, you know, 1,700 years ago, it's still a classic. But Augustine begins the book this way. One line, which is the summary of the book in his life, he said, he's talking to God. He said, you have made us, Lord, you have made us restless, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We've been made restless, and our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Now, the book of Kohelf, um, sometimes the Bible, to your Bible, will have that Ecclesiastes, not to be mixed up with Ecclesiasticus, which is another book. <laughs> okay. But actually, the, the word Ecclesiastes, you know, which is the Greek word, the Hebrew word is Kohelf, means the preacher, the preacher. Now, that's a book you all recognize has a very famous passage in it, and that's the famous passage about, passage about there's a season. Remember, there's all kinds of songs, there's a season for everything, a time to be born, time to die, time to live, time to grow, time to see, time to harvest, time to scatter, time to gather, and you have those 14 opposites. You know, the seekers and different rock groups made a beautiful song out of that. We read it in church. There's a season for everything, but we stop reading too soon. You know, he contrasts those 14 opposites, and he says there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. Then what he really wants to say is this, he says, God has made everything in its own time, but God has put timelessness, timelessness into the human heart so that the human beings out of sync with the seasons from the beginning to the end. It's quite a line. 
He says, you know, God made nature, and nature is this beautiful rhythm, spring, summer, winter, fall, you know, life, you know, the cycle of life, and cows give birth to calves, and they grow up, and they have children. And he said, nature has this beautiful season, it has this beautiful rhythm, but you don't fit. You've been out of sync with the seasons from beginning to end. You know, see, human beings, he said, because you have a timelessness inside of you, which animals and plants don't have. He used to tell anthropology students, he said, you know what the difference is between humans and animals? It's this. Cattle can tentatively munch grass in pastures, and human beings discontentedly smoke grass in bars. <laughs> <laughs> We're both for the grass, but we do it a little differently. <laughs> See, cattle don't have timelessness in them. Human beings do. And that's why it's not simple being a human being. Or one of the quotes that I noticed on one of the green sheets from Carl Rahner. Uh, Carl Rahner says, and it, it's, it's convoluted language that's only a German can write, but it, it has a, a, a brilliance to it. Carl Rahner says, in the torment of the insufficiency of everything you can attain, you ultimately learn that here in this life, there is no finished symphony. It's quite a lie. He said, in the torment, it's in one of those green sheets on your table. In the torment of the insufficiency of everything you attain, you ultimately learn that in this life, there is no finished symphony. You'll always be, there'll be something missing. You know, when you read stories in the Old Testament, and they should come with a disclaimer, you know. So much of the Old Testament, if you read it literally, it's awful, you know. Sometimes when the reader reads it, it says, this is the word of God, they should say, this is the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> People are getting killed and all. Kinds of so God tells Joshua, he said, when you get into the promised land, kill everybody. All the men, women, children, and animals, you know. But isn't that a wonderful word of God? <laughs> But see, what they should have a disclaimer, like when you watch movies, they say, you know, no real horses die making this film. Okay. They say, no real people die in, this, in this, these stories, you know. So one of those, because they call them, those are archetypal stories. They're stories of the soul. And they're, they say, are they true? They're always true, you know. And, and they happen to everybody, not just to the people there. But one of them is in the book of Judges, chapter 11. And it tells a story of this king with an unpronounceable name, with about 26 syllables to it, you know. And he's at war, so he's at war, this Jewish king, but he's losing. So he makes a deal with God. He tells God, if you let me win the war, then when I get back to my kingdom, I'll kill the first person I see as a sacrifice to you. Isn't that wonderful? So, so God hears his prayer, lets him win the war. Then he comes back and he crosses the border into his own country, but then he's distressed because the first person he meets is his own daughter, who's just in the bloom of youth. So he tells her, well, this is terrible. I made a promise to God I'd kill the first person I see, and now I, it's you, I can't do it. She said, no, no, you can do it. He said, I'm willing to die at the altar of sacrifice, but it's one thing. He says, now I'm gonna die a virgin. I'll die by having a non-consummated life. So what I need to do, you need to give me 40 days and 40 nights and I'll go into the desert with my maiden companions, and we're going to bewail my virginity. So they do that. They go into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and set up this howl to the moon that she's going to die in consummate. Then she comes back and dies on the altar of sacrifice. And this is the word of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> on the surface, that's a purely horrible story. <laughs> Patriarchy, murder, human sacrifice, and so on. No, it's a deep story. When it, it, the story about us, we're all going to die <coughs> virgin, which means we're all going to die non-consummate. Rahner, nobody gets to finish symphony in this world, you know. See, because we have that eternal fire inside of us. You know, remember as a 19-year-old student studying philosophy and kind of understanding some stuff. <laughs> okay. And reading Thomas Aquinas, and Thomas Aquinas says, now, he said, what would be the adequate object of human intellect and will? You ever asked yourself that? <laughs> he said, basically saying, what would you need for you to be satisfied? Say, it's enough. I know enough, I've felt enough, I've experienced enough, I've tasted enough. He said, well, it would have to be all being. 
You'd have to know everything and be everywhere and, and be in, in intimacy with everything. <clears throat> and he's right, you know, because we're made for the infinite. So that, uh, and that's what the, the image and likeness of God is inside of us. You know, the first thing we're taught in Judeo-Christian tradition, human beings, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. But we have a pious notion of that, you know, iconic, that we somehow think that you're made in, somewhere inside of you in your heart, there's this beautiful image of God, and you have like an icon. Well, that could be true, but what it means, you no, know, God is fire. God is infinity, you know, which means you're born, and inside of you there's a God or a goddess that is not going to make easy peace with this world, you know. Gods and goddesses have infinite appetites. They want to make love to the world. They want to eat up and drink up everything and so on. That's us, you know. Pascal, the famous French philosopher, once said, he says, all the misery of the human being comes from the fact that nobody can sit still in a room for one hour. Try it sometime. Maybe you're tired enough you can do it. Okay. It's called depression, okay. Um, you know, sometimes with little kids, you know, little kids are at church and they're fussing around. And someone says, can't you sit still? They should say, Mom, it's not my fault. Blame that on God. Okay. Um, because we can't sit still. And so on. Um, Albert Camus, the famous French philosopher, I won't do all these examples and so on. Um, Albert Camus um, was an atheist. But he was a deep-thinking atheist. He won the Nobel Prize. In fact, when he won the Nobel Prize, it was in Sweden, somebody asked him, are you an atheist? Do you believe in God? And Camus said, I don't believe in God, but I'm obsessed with the question of God, because only God, the question of God, only God could make sense of our lives. So here's this very sincere man, doesn't believe in God, but it's, it's really, you know, owning his own human experience and the experience of the world, and he says, it can't make sense. And that's the origin of, you know, the great existentialist in French and Germany, you know, Camus, Sartre, and all these people and so on, Schopenhauer, these were sincere men and women who, who tried to make sense of their life and, and they, they experienced this infinity, but if you don't believe in God, how do you make sense of that? So Camus says, um, this, this is an image of, of a human being, very interesting. Uh, he says, you know, I understand human life, and he uses the image of, the, of a medieval prison. You know what they used to in a medieval prison? They were psychologically smart. They would make the prison box, the, the, the cell was always too small for the person in it. So you imagine somebody's five foot ten. So they'd have to, the prison would be five feet, so he could never stand up straight. And it would be too short, four feet, so the person could never stretch out. So the person would be in a, in a prison cell, they could never fully stand up, they could never fully stretch out. And the idea is, eventually it breaks their spirit. If you can't ever fully stand up, you can't ever fully stretch out. Eventually, that's going to break your heart and break your spirit. And they're right. But that's, can you say, that's true for all of us in this life. You know, your spirit and what's really inside of it, it can never stretch out. The, the world is simply too small a place for you, for your dreams, for your heart, for what you need to do. And eventually, it's, that's not, you know what happens with many, many of the people as they age, we age into depression. We age into a certain sadness. We age into a certain resignation. You know, it's understandable. Um, you know, we end up, and oftentimes, sadly, some people age into anger, into bitterness, and uh, it's always been there. It just comes out later. Um, now, uh, or, or in in in, in our uh, society, oftentimes you see that. Where, where you have so many books about people looking to find their soulmate. Very few people do find a soulmate because uh, um, your heart is bigger than anybody you're ever going to meet, and so on. Now, we have that experience. I want to get to spirituality in a second, but I'm still circling the mountain. Here, okay? <laughs> and it's, as I said, it's at the center of our experience, it's not the periphery. And how do we cope with it? Well, we cope with it in two ways. More superficially, we cope with it through distraction, through entertainment, through pleasure, through whatever, you know. 
uh, we distract ourselves, okay? And that's okay, I'm not, I'm not making a moral judgment of this. But more deeply, we try to cope with it through what? You know, through meaning, through trying to get meaning in our lives. And remember the old expression to say, you know what you should do in the world, in, in life? Make sure you plant a tree, have a child, and write a book. Why? Because then you leave a mark. You, know, you plant a tree, you die, but the tree stays. You have a child, your, 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 your biology, your name, your person goes on. You write a book, it's in a library somewhere, so you, you left a mark. You know? So we, we try to do it some kind of significance, you know, we unconsciously as we get older try to write our obituary to, so it's published, but, uh, you know, that we leave some kind of a mark. Now, all that leads up to this, what is spirituality? That energy inside of that, that's your spirit. That isn't, that isn't what your spirit does. That is your spirit. You know, your spirit, you, you, you're not, somebody has to us, who gets that, that loneliness, that restlessness, that aching, that affinity, that is your soul, that's your spirit. And what you do with your spirit is your spirituality. Notice the word spirituality is simply what you do with your spirit. And everybody's going to do something with it. You know, everybody has a spiritual life. You know, and in, the, in my book, I use, I use three examples of this. You know, uh, that probably changed them today because the examples are dating. I wrote that book more than 20 years ago. But, but I gave three examples of three women, their spirituality. And I, and I begin with a quote from uh, the great Lutheran theologian Kierkegaard. And Søren Kierkegaard once said, he said, you know, if I ask you this, how do you define a saint? What's a saint? And Kierkegaard said, to be a saint is to will the one thing. It's an interesting definition. To be a saint is to will the one thing. Now, that sounds easy, but it's the most difficult thing in the world to do. Why? Because we will everything. You know, Henry Nouwen was one of the great, well, certainly the most popular spiritual writer of our generation. And Henry Nouwen uh, was so honest in sharing his own restlessness and soul and so on. And here Henry Nouwen says, you know what? He said, I struggle with trying to be a saint. So you know why? He said, he said, I will God, but I want to will everything else. So he says this, he says, I want to be a great saint, but I also want to experience all the sensations that sinners experience. <laughs> he said, I want to have a deep life of prayer, but I don't want to miss anything on television. <laughs> he said, I want to have a radical lifestyle for the poor. He said, but I want to fly on airplanes and go all around the world. See, we want the right things, but we want everything else too. Now, you know, our spirit, we want everything. Now, that makes it difficult. So let's do three examples of spirituality. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was acknowledged as a saint and rightly so. Now, Mother Teresa, you know, it's very interesting. We always consider Mother Teresa a holy woman. Nobody ever considers her an erotic woman. <laughs> Some of the word eros and Mother Teresa don't go together. But they should. Mother Teresa had a powerful, powerful spirit. And had she not been a great saint, I'm sure she'd have been a great sinner. <laughs> she wasn't an ordinary woman. She had this powerful, she was like a steamer, a steamroller in history, you know. But notice what's channeled. She willed the one thing God and the poor, God and the poor, and all that fire and power inside of her was just God and the poor. Makes a saint. Now, take somebody the opposite. In the, in the book, I used uh, Janis Joplin, but you can put in Amy Winehouse, you can put in Freddie Mercury, you can put in Michael Jackson, it just starts here. These are people, let's, let's take somebody in Janis Joplin, you know, powerful energy. And they could create powerful energy. Or if you've just seen the, or if you saw the movie, for instance, on Eddie Mer on, uh, not Eddie, Freddie Mercury on Rhapsody, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, the power, the energy inside of these people, they can shoot the lights out, you know. But those that have all the energy, but it goes all over. And they all die young. They don't kill themselves. They just, they dissipate and fall apart because after all, they can't sleep, they can't eat, they, you know, and they, they just die. Okay? But that is their spiritual life. See, Mother Teresa's spiritual life is God and the poor. That's what her... That's what she does with her spirit. For them, it's all this energy they create and so on, and eventually which kills them, um, 
That is their spiritual life. It's not that Mother Teresa has a spirituality and, and Janis Joplin or Amy Winehouse didn't. You know, Amy Winehouse had a different spirituality. But that's what she did with her spirit. Then in between, you have a perfect in between. If you know the story of Princess Diana, she died actually about a week apart from Mother Teresa, you know. Um, but Princess Diana was just the, the perfect in the middle. So Princess Diana, she willed a lot of the right things. So she'd go and work with Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa taught her how to say the rosary. In fact, she's buried with a rosary in her hand from Mother Teresa. She could work with the poor, and she'd do this. Then she'd come back and go to the Mediterranean and have an affair with a, with a playboy. She'd come back to Mother Teresa, back to the playboy. And eventually, that also killed her, but it's her spiritual life. But it's interesting, her funeral, which, you know, up until John Paul II died, it's probably the most you know, watched funeral in history. Up at the, the, the most watched funeral of all of history is Princess Diana's funeral, which was interesting because, you know, there's many celebrities, and she wasn't the biggest celebrity in the world. Uh, but remember the homily, her, the homily, the eulogy her brother gave at her funeral, which is very interesting. It actually was a, a combination of brilliance and stupidity, but they can go together sometimes. <laughs> so he starts, and not very bright, so he says, you know, there's going to be this quick thing to canonize my sister. He said, but she's bigger than all of that. Remember, that's the Beatles. We're more popular than Jesus. That's when you're juvenile, you're young, you can say stuff like that. <laughs> but then he redeemed himself. He said, you know, my, my sister had this incredible popularity. Um, and a lot of people really loved her, which is true. And he says, and you ask yourself, why? He said, well, people say they loved her because she was a beautiful woman. He said, no, it's not true at all. He said, many women are beautiful, they're in love for it, oftentimes they're hated for it, you know. Uh, you can be just as much hated for your qualities and loved for it. He said, that's not why they loved her. He said, they loved her because she was vulnerable and she couldn't hide her weakness from, from humanity, which is really true. Her, her weakness was, was on display and people related to it. But notice, she was exactly this half Mother Teresa, half Janice Joplin. You know, and that was also, that was her spiritual life. You know, I think somewhere we fall in between there. <laughs> we're not Mother Teresa, we're not Janice Joplin, we're all kind of like Princess Diana. You know, we're willing to write things, we're willing too many things, like, like Henry Dowell says, I want to be a great saint, but I want to experience all these sensations that everybody else experiences and so on. Uh, that is our spiritual life. See, so your spirituality is not something you do outside of your life. You know, going to church and so on, that's part of your spirituality. But your spirituality, you might never say a prayer or never go to church or whatever, you have a spirituality. Okay. What do we do with our spirit? Okay. Um, now, that's spirituality. What is education? <clears throat> what does it mean to educate or to teach? Okay. And here the etymology is, 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 is a good, uh, is helpful. You know, etymologies of words aren't always important. Sometimes they, they're really good. This, the word education comes from the Latin educere. But educere is the Latin verb to lead out of. So, for instance, when you draw something out of somebody, so it's already inside of that. So, for instance, when a, when a, a sculpture would, or, or somebody working with clay would simply mold something, see, they're educere. They're, 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 they're taking this piece of clay and they're just leading a form out of it. See, so the first thing about education, and very importantly, is education isn't programming. You know, you program a computer. We also get programmed as human There's a lot of information that's fed inside of us. That's not so much education. That, that's learning, you know. Education, and all the education, real education is you're drawing it out of somebody. You're, you're drawing it out so that uh, you have to awaken something that's already inside the person. I want to give you, I want to tease that out for you. To awaken something that's already inside of you. I don't know if you know who Nikos Kassenzakis was. It's just a little story for flavor here, but Nikos Kassenzakis was a great Greek writer. He was the person who absorbed the Greek. And he wrote the book, The Last Temptation of Jesus, which incidentally is a great book. It wasn't a great movie, 
and don't be, and then, I'm not sure why everybody was so scandalized it's actually a pretty orthodox Christological book, you know. But actually, that's, that's a very deep book. You know, if you know anything about Kassin Zak, he's one of the most intense men who ever lived. He was an artist. And whenever he wrote a book, he would get into it. For instance, before he wrote The Last Temptation of Jesus, he went to Israel and he lived for three years there. And he tried to do everything Jesus did. He stayed in the desert for 40 days. He'd be nights out on the sea. And he'd always work himself to the edges of a nervous breakdown. Then he sequestered himself in a hotel room in Jerusalem for six weeks and wrote this book. Then he was burned out for two years. So if you read the book, you'll see the passion, the fire and stuff inside of him. But anyway, he was the very intense, and as a young man, who was Greek Orthodox, he thought when he was 19 he would become a monk. So he spent the summer up on Mount Athos as a 19-year-old, thinking he'd become a monk. And in his autobiography, which is actually a very mature book, he wrote a book when he was dying of cancer called Report to Greco, which is a masterpiece of a book. But in there he talks about that summer when he was in the monastery. So you have to picture this young, intense, 19-year-old person you know, trying to set the world on fire. And he gets to befriend an old monk, Father Macarius. Macarius is already 80 years old. He said an ascetic. He said there wasn't much left of him but the eyes. He said he was a holy man. So, so he said the first time he went to see the old monk, he was in, he says, uh, the monk looked at him and says, what do you want? <laughs> so he said, I want some spiritual advice. He said, well, sit down. So, so the old monk came, he said, he took me by the knees, and he said, he looked into my eyes for a long time. And he said, I can give you some advice. I can give you some advice. He said, you're asleep. He said, you're asleep. He said, now wake up before death wakes you up. <laughs> no, he said, you're asleep. Wake up before death wakes you up. So Cass and Zachary said, I said to him, well, I'm only 19, I'm young. He said, the old monk said, uh, death loves the young. Wake up. <laughs> okay. Now, I use that expression, you know, in Buddhism, and Buddhism is a great religion, okay, and it's older than Christianity, there's many deep spiritual insights, but they consider all learning, spiritually and otherwise, as a question of waking up. See, real learning is to come from inside, so that what, what you do when we teach, you have to awaken what's already inside the person. You know, if, if you listen to uh, or sometimes you read a book or whatever, and, you, and, and it's like waking up and just, I knew that, I knew this, but now you know it, you know it. You got words around it. But I want to give you some background to that. Probably the, the, the top Catholic intellectual of our century, our generation, was a man called Bernard Lonergan, who was actually a Canadian, um, was a Jesuit. Um, and he was one of the great intellectuals of, of you know, the last hundred years. But Bernard Lonergan said this, very interesting. He says, when you're born, he said, when you're born, you don't come into this world with kind of a blank mind that, you know, and then you learn stuff here. So imagine a baby's born, it's not like a white piece of photographic paper that you imprint stuff into, or, you know, or some hardware that you program. He said, you're born with the brand, you know, when you brand a cow. He said, you're born with the brand of the first principles inside of your heart, your soul. It's quite a lie. So you're born with the brand of the first principles. But what are the first principles? They're four. They'll say, they're the four transcendental properties of God. If you say, God is what? You say, God is one, true, good, and beautiful. You know, God is one, true, good, and beautiful. So Lonergan says, you're born and you know, that image like of God, that's stamped inside of you. So when you're born, you come to consciousness, you don't have to teach a baby what's beautiful. You don't have to sit kids, sit kids out and say, look, I want to distinguish between ugly and beautiful. You know, they recognize beauty. You recognize ugliness. You don't have to distinguish between this is what's good and what's bad. Sometimes there's a little subtle moral distinction that make, but, you know, or truth. You don't have to distinguish between now you're telling the truth, now you're telling a lie. That's inside of us. You know, we have to wake up to it. See, so education puts us in touch with that. You know, education, it puts you in touch with the good, the true, the beautiful, but it's inside, it awakens inside of you. It's Buddhism, it's also good philosophy, and so on. That, uh, 
See, so that's what education is. I mean, there's also education where we, we need to be programmed like computers. <laughs> you know, we're hardware and there's a lot of software has to be put into us, you know. But um, there's a lot of, the major software is already inside of us. You know, you're not pure hardware when you're born, you know. God has already put the deepest programs in you. The ones, the wonders, the truth, the goodness, and beauty. You know, it's interesting, we know what goodness, truth, and beauty are, what's the oneness? I actually emphasize that because today it's become really, really important. Oneness is simply this. It means reality is one. God is one, which means there's no contradiction inside of it. You know, it, it allows us to think and be logical. Um, I can give you, you understand it by its opposite. You know, I live in the United States now, and uh, nobody knows anymore what's true and what's false. You know, well, this is fake news, this is not fake, you know, and so, so after a while, two and two might be five, you know, if you still, so the really true, see, for us to think and so on, we have to know two and two is always four. You know, CNN, to their credit, about a year ago, they put an ad on. Now, who they were going against, many people, and so on. But it was a good ad. So CNN put an ad on and said, they showed an apple. They said, this is an apple. This is an apple. They said, and no matter how many times you say it's an orange, it'll never be an orange. It's always an apple. You can say a thousand times an orange, it'll always be an apple. It was an ad on television. I thought, it's a good ad. <laughs> <laughs> See, what's true is what's true. And today there's so much, I'm not just, I mean, Donald Trump, across the board, there's so much fudging of truth. And you know what's the most dangerous, single thing we can do? You know, remember scripture says, Satan is the prince of lies. Satan is not the prince of sex or the prince of pride even. Satan is the prince of lies. The most single dangerous sin we can commit is lying. You know why? Because if we lie long enough, we'll believe the lie. You know, if there's anybody in hell, there's nobody in hell saying, if I had a chance over, I'd go and make an act of contrition and go to heaven. God, God would say, here's your chance, come and go to heaven. If there's anybody in hell, they're feeling sorry for people in heaven. They're seeing heaven as hell. They're seeing light as darkness. They're seeing truth as falsehood. See, that's the unforgivable sin of the Holy Spirit, which begins by lying. You know? So God is one, and we know oneness. The first time you tell a lie, you know it. If you tell the same lie about 50 times, you don't know it's a lie anymore. You know? See, but, but the, we're, we're, we're born oneness, truth, goodness, and beauty are inside of us. And the task of all education is to wake that up. You know? Uh, whether you're a mother, you're a father, you're a priest, whether you're a teacher, you're a friend, you know, and so on. We're always trying to educe oneness, truth, goodness, beauty. Um, we're not teaching people that. We're trying to have them come to the consciousness of what's already inside of them. You will never learn any deep thing which you already didn't know. Okay? You'll learn some computer stuff and software you didn't know and so on. But everything that's profoundly deep and meaningful, you already know it. Um, the task is to, to, wake, to, wake, to awaken it. You know, um, it's interesting. Uh, Henry Nouwen, the great spiritual writer, he had a concept he called first love. He said, uh, um, and, and for, for, him, for him he meant first love isn't the first time he fell in love. He said, we're born, he said, with a concept, we have a dark memory, he said, of first love. But for him it meant that you have an unconscious memory of once being inside of God. And see, so that it's not a conscious memory, but God is one, true, good, and beautiful. He said, we, 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 we have this, this conscious memory of that. It's interesting when you read the Greek Stoics, you know, and the, the Greek Stoics, they, they were... They were very religious people, you know. And they believed that souls came from God. They were very dualistic. You know, they believed that souls came from the other world, they just inhabited bodies, you know. Um, but they believed this, and some of it is actually quite cute. They say that God puts souls into bodies, and the last thing God does 
before God puts the soul in the body is God kisses the soul and then he seals the memory of that kiss so that he can't remember it and, uh, and they believe, <laughs> it's pretty earthy, they, they believe that God put the soul in the body shortly before the baby's born, okay? And, uh, and that's why they didn't have any problem with abortion in those years. They didn't believe there was a soul in the body until... They said, and the last thing God does is he seals the memory, and that's why you have a cleft under your nose. See, God seals your lips. Can't remember having been kissed by God in the, in the former life and so on. And they also say, and that's why whenever you're trying to remember something, your finger will go under your nose. <laughs> <laughs> It's way back to when you're with God, but see, it's beautiful imagery. You see, you're born and you always remember that, that you, you've already experienced perfect love. See, you were kissed and embraced by God. You've already experienced perfect love, so you don't have to learn what love is. You recognize love, and you also evaluate love in this life. You know, you've already had, you already know what perfect love is, and you know what measures up and doesn't measure up, and so on. See, it's all inside of you. It's not programmed in later. You don't have to teach a kid what it means to love. They already know what perfect love is. You don't have to teach any of us what love is. We already have experienced perfect love. Not on this side of eternity. No. We maybe had some great moments on this side of eternity, but nobody, you know, we already have perfect love, and that's why nothing quite measures up. We've already known the perfect. We've already known the perfectly good, the perfectly true, and that's why it doesn't measure up. Now, education. The true sense is when we help lead that out of each other. You know, sometimes we have to educate what we, we program, like a computer, teach the grade 8 social studies, <laughs> to teach math or whatever. That's programming, and, and that's very necessary. You know, we also need to be programmed. Uh, that's learning. It's distinct from education. Education is leading out. Helping remember that primordial kiss, helping to remember the goodness, truth, beauty, and so on that we need to lean on each other. So that's spirituality. Spirituality, what do we do with the fire inside of us? Whatever you do, that's your spirituality. Okay. What's education? Education is a duchere. You know, the same as an artist leads a sculpture, leads a form out of clay or out of marble. Um, it's inside the marble. You cut away everything except the form. Um, we need to lead <coughs> each other, not just the kids we deal with. I want to end here just on a poetic note. I want to read you a poem by Annie Sexton. You know who Annie Sexton was? She's a great poet who sadly <laughs> killed herself. Um, but, but just some powerful poetry. I want to give you a two line poem from Annie Sexton, not the one I'm reading. Annie Sexton once says, Jesus hung on the cross for us and died with his arms outstretched, suffering for us. So what do we do? He said, we wear hats in church. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> now, this is one of our famous poems called The Awful Rowing Towards God. The Awful Rowing Towards God. It's a story. A story. Let it come, let it go. He said, I was stamped out into this life like a Plymouth car fender. First came the crib with its glacial bars, and then dolls, and my devotion to their plastic mouths, and then there was school, with straight little rows of chairs, and me blocking my name over and over. But underneath all that time, a stranger whose arms wouldn't work. Then there was life in cruel houses with people who seldom touched, though touch is everything. But I grew. I grew like a pig in a trench coat. I grew, and there were many strange apparitions, nagging rain, and the sun turning into poison, and all that time saws cutting through my heart. But I grew. I grew, and God was there, like an island I had not yet rowed to, and me, ignorant of God, just kept my arms and legs working. When I grew, I wore jewelry, and I bought tomatoes, and now in midlife, but about 19 in my head, I'd say, I'm rowing. I'm finally rowing towards God. Do the oar locks stick in a rusty, and the sea blinks and rolls like a worried eyeball. But I am rowing, though the wind pushes me back, 
And I know that the island I get to will not be perfect. It will have the flaws of this life and the absurdities of the dinner table. But there will be a door. There will be a door and I will open it and I will get rid of the pestilent rat that gnaws inside of me because God will take it in his two hands and God will embrace it. This, as an African might say, is my story, which I have now told you. If it be sweet, if it be not sweet, my story ends with me still growing. Quite Nemesis it says, when I get there to heaven, there'll be a door, said, and I'll get rid of the pestilent rat that's gnawing inside of me, but God will take it in his two hands, and God will embrace it. That's my story for tonight, too. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions or comments or something. We have a little bit of time, but uh, I'm also sitting between you and the social. <laughs> <laughs> and one time I was speaking at a banquet, and you know, as a speaker, that's, that's your least favorite venue to speak at because, uh, you know, people are coming from a meal and they have to be priced and you'll your list of speakers. And they always make you speak between the dessert, just when they're serving the dessert. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I finally start serving dessert and the MC comes over and he says, Father, he said, would this be a good time to introduce you or should we let the people enjoy themselves a little longer? <laughs> <laughs>